Welcome to the Providence. Welcome to the Providence Third Ward. She would let me say that. <laughs> welcome to the funeral services of Sister Theone Bedrero, a beloved member of the Providence Third Ward. I'm Bishop Chad Norton, and I'll be conducting today, and it's an honor to be here. I'd like to recognize my counselor, Brother Jared Parker, here to my left, and President James Swink, which I think he was bishop at the time of Daryl's passing. And I'd like to acknowledge him. I'd also like to thank Sister Madeline Barlow, a dear friend, and uh, Stephanie, I don't know how to say the last name, Warcha, and she'll be our chorister today. The family prayer was given by a son-in-law, Gary Ballard, and we'll open up by singing hymn number 308, Love One Another, followed by an opening prayer by a, a granddaughter, Michelle Covet. Our dear Heavenly Father, we humbly bow our heads before thee today to honor the life of our mother, grandmother, and friend, Fionn Bajero. Heavenly Father, we were blessed to know her and to have her in our lives. Please give each of us comfort today. Please comfort those who are speaking, that they may share the things that are in their hearts. Heavenly Father, at this time, we ask a special blessing upon each of us that we may always keep a piece of grandma in our hearts, that we may follow her example in family the highest priority and the utmost commitment. Heavenly Father, bless us to love each other and remember the love that she taught us. We say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Michelle. The program will go as follows. Uh, we'll first hear from three of the children, Dory, Richard, and Doug. And we'll have a music selection and sung by the grandchildren, Close to the Edge of Heaven, accompanied by Sister Jamie Caliendo. And then we'll have tributes from the other three children, Nadine, Kay, and Linda. Following that, we'll have a musical number, The Star of the East by a grandson, um, David Young. We'll go to that one. Neil Chapman Bedro, loving wife, mother, grandmother, and friend, 
was re reunited with her beloved husband and father in heaven on December 26, 20, 2021, at the age of 93, surrounded by her six children. Born on September 12, 1928 in Logan, Utah, the sixth child and fifth girl of James Erastus and Eva Elison Chapman. On the day of her birth, her older brother, Bill, was asked by a neighbor, what you get, Bill? Which, in which he replied, another damn girl. <laughs> First impressions aside, Bill and Theon would remain close until his death. What mom could remember of her childhood was very happy. While her parents may not have had a lot of money, they were extremely loving and kind. Raz, as her dad was known, had many jobs during, his or during her childhood. While he was working for a carnival, she and a friend would ride to the top of the Ferris wheel, and that's where they would pay, play with paper dolls for hours. She would also help with the soda water or ice cream booths, and her daddy would always say that she could make money or make change faster than any adult. She was 11 at that time. On her 12th birthday, she fell off of her bike and broke her back. As a result, she spent six months in a brace and her back was never the same after that. Her parents also operated a motel. As a result, she could make a bed with perfectly square corners and would go on to teach her children and her grandchildren to do the same. I also don't ever recall a time that my mother's bed was not made. At the age of 15, mom was roller skating at the Logan Roller Rink, where she met the man that would later become her husband, Daryl Pedrero. One of dad's friends came over and said to mom, if you don't stop looking over, then Daryl's going to start dating you. Well, dad came over and said, what did my friend say to you? And she told him. And then he replied, well, I guess I better start dating you then. Daryl walked the own home that night. Her mother was taking hot bread out of the oven when they arrived. So they ate hot bread, jelly, and milk. Daryl stayed until 1 a.m. He returned the next day, and they were inseparable for nearly 70 years. They were married June 26th in 1945 in Preston, Idaho, and set a goal to be sealed in the Salt Lake Temple on their first anniversary. While still expecting their first child, mom was walking out of church and caught her heel. She fell down four stairs. She, spent, she then went to the hospital that afternoon and was there until Sunday when she gave birth to their first daughter, Linda. After a very long extended stay at the hospital, they were finally released to go home. Everything went well until on June 1st. On June 1st, my dad was in an accident at work. He was taken by, to the hospital by ambulance. When mom arrived at the hospital, the doctors told her dad's pelvis was broken, he had severe damage to his bladder, and he would never walk again. Mom was a 17-year-old girl with one baby at home and another on the way. She was terrified. Dad's boss, who was also their bishop, turned to my mom and said, Sister Pedrero, Daryl told me you were getting, you were going to the temple on the 26th. Is that correct? Mom said, well, yes. He says, well, he said, I promise you, you will go and Daryl will walk through the temple. The following day when they took x-rays, there wasn't one broken bone in dad's body. So on June 26, 1946, they took their baby daughter with them and they were sealed in the Salt Lake City Temple for time and all eternity. When Linda was a year old, one year and 11 days old, they welcomed their second daughter, Eva Kay. Nadine followed a year later and their fourth child, their first son, which dad was pretty happy about, Daryl Douglas was born in 1949. Richard was born in 1956, and I rounded out the family as a very surprise addition in 1965. They bought a house in Providence, and they settled at 345 South Main Street in 1954, where they would remain for the rest of their lives, save a move next door to 335 South Main Street in Providence, 
until mom moved to Terrace Grove in August of this year. Mom recalled shortly after moving to Providence, dad gifted her with a shiny mop bucket for Mother's Day. The absolute worst gift she thought she could have ever possibly received. Reflecting on the incident later in her journal, she described how she talked it over with her mom. Her mom was the most beautiful woman in the world. And she remembered thinking, if I could ever be that beautiful, sweet and wise, I will be okay. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was essential to mom, and she served in very many different in many different callings throughout her life. Mother loved music and loved to sing. One of the goals was to sing a solo in the Logan Tabernacle, a goal that she fulfilled singing King All Glorious at State, at State Conference in 1959. She also sang at the, the re rededication of the Logan Temple in 1979. Mom served as the Ward Relief Society president and made lifelong friendships with the women with which she served. The Society of the Released remained closed throughout mom's life, celebrating birthdays and holidays together at long luncheons. And Sister Madeline Barlow is playing the, the organ for us today. Mom and dad served in the Jackson, Mississippi mission from 1994 to 1995, in which they made la many lasting impressions with many friends. Theone was a bit of a spitfire though. We all heard her utter, damn it, Daryl, on more than one occasion. During the last couple of years, she was at home. She accidentally hit her life alert more than once, Linda and I know. <laughs> One exhilarating time, both me and my daughter Mandy beat the paramedics to her house, only to meet mom as the ambulance and paramedics and fire truck pulled up with sirens going and lights flashing. Mom was trying to tie her duster over her nightgown and open the front door with an exasperated, oh hell. <laughs> Just a couple of days before her death, she had decided when Nadine and Gary had her in the hospital that she had had enough of that also, and she was leaving. So she tried to undo her blood pressure thing and take the, they had actually taped the pulse monitor on her finger. Um, she looked at Gary, and I know I shouldn't say this, as Gary was trying to tell her that she needed to stay put and tell her a story. She said, oh, bullshit. <laughs> when he tried to disagree with her. She had had enough that day. And these times are more memorable because we really didn't hear mom swear. So mom loved her family more than anything, wanting nothing more for, than for us to be happy and to love and care for each other. Her journal reads, you are, my, you are all beautiful, all of you. I want to tell you that my prayers are with you all the time. There is a scripture in 3 John chapter 1, verse 4, and it says, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. When you are hurting, I am hurting. If you have a problem, I have a problem too. I love you all so much. I pray for all of you every day. How blessed I am to have all of you. You know there is so much love in my heart for you. She would always tell us how proud of us she was and ask whatever she did to deserve such a beautiful, wonderful family. In reality, I don't know what we all did to deserve her. Words cannot describe the love I have for my mother. Recently, while I had her at lunch at Costa Vida, a lady came out of the blue. She saw me helping my mom sit down and get seated and she came up and says, you have a beautiful mother. When I expressed to her that my mother was 92 years old, she just smiled and said, what a beautiful mother you have. Just like my mom said about her mom, I now say it about her. <laughs> my mom was the most beautiful, kind, and loving woman in this world. And she will definitely be missed. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
stage. By the way, I did know mom got a snuggle bill and a 12 gauge shotgun for Tristan for her birthday also. Not sure what else, but she did get them too. I thought about this for a couple of days and I called Nadine the other day and I said, Nadine, I'm not a public speaker. She said, that's all right. You don't have to say much. Just be quick and Linda will take up the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah. Mom was always there to support all of us. Even back when I raised corn, she would take me in to sell the corn at Grandpa's. When I knew, took or delivered newspapers, she was there to take me out around the newspaper lot or newspaper out when it was cold. When we went to Linda or to Sacramento, California to see Linda, I bought my first mini bike there. And we put it in the trunk of the car. Mom wasn't real happy. The luggage had to go on the top, but we got it home. And she was always right there. My daughter the other day told me that when Dory lived in St. George, her and mom and Emily and Kimberly went down to St. George to see Dory. And it's coming back, the car broke down. So mom sent Kimberly and Emily hitchhiking to the next town to get the tow truck while she sent it the car. I'd probably get arrested for child abuse now if she'd done that. <laughs> but she was always right there, and it was real hard the last few years. Every time I'd go up and see her, she'd just tell me how much she missed dad that she ought to be with dad. I told her it wasn't her time now. She had to stay. <laughs> this was her time. <laughs> She's gone. The last thing she said to me, she just wanted to be around for Christmas to make all the kids happy. Thanks, Mom. Well, for once, it's good not to be the youngest or the oldest. <laughs> but, but when I think of my mom, you think of all the stories and all, all of the memories and all of the good times. Because, you know, after three girls, I come along. And mom soon realized that I was not like my sweet three sisters. <laughs> and she used to tell me often that when I was born, my dad's feet never touched the ground as he walked into the hospital room. But she was always there and she was always there for all of us. And I remember living in Logan for my early years. I think we moved to Providence when I was five. And I still have some fond memories of Logan. I remember the Little house we lived in was a two two room house, <laughs> and there was four of us in that. Uh, actually, there were six of us, count mom and dad, in that two room house. Then we moved to Providence, and here's this big old house with a big old barnyard, and we had cows and we had chickens and we raised beans and and there was all kinds of space and all kinds of room. And dad finished the upstairs for all of us, and and out in front of the house, which is right behind the church, by the way there was an irrigation ditch. And I remember mother telling me, if you fall in that ditch, you'll die. <laughs> so of course, you know, me being me, one day I'm in the ditch. So I come into the house crying, I was maybe six, and I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. <laughs> well, trust me, after that, whenever there was a group around, she thrilled in telling them that story. <laughs> That was her way of, of, of getting even with me. But, but for the fond memories, I will never forget how she treated her parents and her dad's parents. She was always there for them. She was always praising them. If ever any of them ever had any issues, she was there. Grandma Badrillo would come over. Mom was always there to take her to town. And that stuck with me forever, is how well she treated her parents. And 
in retrospect, that was the kind of person she was. That was her example to teach us how to treat our parents and, and what an example that was. Well, then soon after that, Dory came along, or Richard, and I had a brother. I thought that was pretty special. And then after that, Dory came along. And Richard had a baby sister. He kind of liked that part. He didn't like being the youngest in the family anymore. So when that baby sister came along, Richard was a happy guy. And we were all happy guys. And, and, and I, I thought more than once how blessed we were that Richard and Dory came along. So as life went on, dad worked for Providence City. I was thinking this morning, driving over, it was snowing. Everybody was out shoveling and cleaning the locks. And I remember dad, every time it snowed, would be out in the snow plow. And there's only two snow plows. So there's two snow plows for all of Providence. And they had their, they had their roots. And first of all, they'd hit the hills and they had their roots to the main arteries and all those things. Well, while they're out doing that after plowing snow for 10 or 12 hours, people calling mom saying, how come my road isn't cleared? Well, dad had come home after 16 hours, mom had telling me to go get in the truck and go clear the road. <laughs> because that's just the kind of guy, the guy, kind of guy that he was. But dad finally retired, finally. And they had a trailer house. They love the trailer house. First, they were part of the Good Sam group. Then they formed their own group called the Good Timers. And those Good Timers were almost like their second family. And some of those Good Timers are here today. Some of those Good Timers come and talk to us last night. And all they did was praise mom and dad and tell me stories about mom. One of them told me that they were camping at Blacksmith Fort Canyon. And mom was in fixing chili or something for everybody. Well, a mink got in the trailer house. And pretty soon the mink had smelled that chili and the mink was up on the stove. They said, we could hear your mother scream all over the trailer park. So she went and she, she made Daryl take out everything in the, in the trailer looking for that mink. And she says, so they did that. They couldn't find mink. Well, there was a little public restroom up there. So mother goes into the restroom with the minks in there waiting for him. <laughs> he says it was ugly. <laughs> so, so they enjoyed they enjoyed their good their good timers. Uh, they they were a close group and they had a lot of fun and they brought a lot of joy to each other. Well they took their trailer house every year to St. George. And I remember going and seeing them and it seemed like every year there was their dad got sick, but that was okay because they, they were together. That's all they wanted. So we bought a condo down there. And we said, why don't you go stay in our condo? And and bought it for a reason. And I didn't want to see dad and mother driving down there dragging that trailer anymore. Well, so they they enjoyed their winters down there. Well, I'm living in Florida at the time and traveling a lot. Well, I had some meetings in Las Vegas and I haven't seen them for a while. So I called and I said, look, I'll finish these meetings in Las Vegas and I'll come up and visit. Oh yeah, that'd be great. So I finished my meeting in Vegas. I drive up to St. George, planning on getting there about lunchtime. And I did that for a reason. And that's because I've been on the road for quite a while. I just wanted a good home cooked meal. So I walk in the condo and we hug and everything. And there I had Arby's chicken sandwiches and French fries. <laughs> I think mom could kind of sense the disappointment. And she says, well, you have to understand that today is card day. And we got all the neighbors coming to play cards. <laughs> well, they love to have, they love to be around. She loved to be around people. And so all the, so I says, I'd eat my chicken sandwich and give them a hug and laugh <laughs> because I wasn't going about to interfere with card day that day. <laughs> but, but the memories, we were always a very close family. And the memories, it even got ever, even closer after dad passed away because we all knew that she needed her family. And Bless her heart, as 
Dory says, every time we talk to her, she say, well, we don't, I don't know what I did to deserve such a great family. And I'd always say, well, we don't know what we did to deserve such a great mom. And bless her heart, I was telling President Swink, I still think he was bishop because the last time I stood here, he was. And I says, you know, very few people can leave this world not having an enemy. She's one of them. And he said, yep, you're right. So I'd like to uh, read a poem, but before that, I need to thank my sisters. Since dad's been gone, my sisters have been there for mom. Hardly a day went by, they weren't there. She loved to go to town and she loved to shop. And in fact, a few days before her fall, she was pushing a shopping cart around the store, buying another dress. They go all about 25 or 30 others that she had that probably still had tags on them. But words can never express, ever. My appreciation for my sister and what they did for my mom. They were there every day. Took her to countless doctor's appointments. If there was any function to go to, one of them was there to take her. And I know she appreciated it because she told me every time I talked to her. So I've been very fortunate to know that they were there, living far away. I don't know how it would have, how I'd have been able to do that if I didn't know that my sisters were there. And I appreciate them. So I'd like to close with, if I can, by just reading a small poem that I found. It's called The Mother's Crown. The author is unknown. And it said, heaven lit up with a mighty presence as the angels all looked down. Today the Lord was placing jewels into my mother's crown. He held up a golden crown as my daughter's mother looked on. And he said in his gentle voice, I will now explain each one. The first gem he said is a ruby. And for its endurance alone, for all the night she winded up for your children to come home. For all the nights by their bedside he stayed till their fever went down for nursing every little wound. I'll add this ruby to your crown. An emerald I'll place by the ruby for leading your children in the right way, for teaching them the lessons that made them who they are today, for always being there through life's important events. I give you a sapphire stone for the time and the love you spent, for untying the strings that held them when they grew and left home. I'll give you this one for courage. The Lord placed a garnet stone. I'll place an amethyst, he said, for all the times you spend on your knees. When you ask me if I take care of your children and then having faith in me. I have a pearl for every little sacrifice that you made without them knowing. For all the times you went without, to keep them healthy, happy, and growing. And last of all, I have a diamond, the greatest of them all, for sharing your unconditional love 
when they were big or they were small. It was your love that helped them grow, feeling safe, happy, and proud. And so, and love so strong, it could lift even the darkest cloud. And then, then the Lord placed the last jewel. He says, your crown is now complete. You've earned your place in heaven with your children at your feet. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. That song was chosen by mother. That says right on the front of it, sing at my funeral. So that was mom's 
request that that would be sung at her funeral. It's a beautiful song. Thank you to all my nieces. Dory said, the mom's house, there's a banner, a sign that says, I have more greater joy than that my children are walking in the truth. It's mom's favorite saying. Mom loved, loved the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints and the Gospel. I remember mom serving. All of, all of our lives, mom served doing one thing or the other. She was a great example of service. She was always taking meals to others. Way back when, a hundred years ago, when I was when we were little, there was an old church house right here on this corner, and uh, we used to go to that church house, and and they used to have what they called Providence bazaars. And I remember going and helping mom at the bazaars. My sisters and brother will remember that also. We always helped with mom at the bazaars. Mom taught primary. She loved Relief Society. We were taught by example. When we lived at home, both of our parents served and they served others well. Mom was over, always over here helping one person or the other, the, the church house, if they needed help. Even though this wasn't mom and dad's church house for the last several years, this has just always been home to us. This was their church. We have a picture just like that in our home that they had made for us. So thankful for all of the example of service and love that our mother showed to us. Up until the last week of her life, mother went to church. She loved church. We're thankful that during COVID, when she couldn't go to church, that, that the priesthood in her ward would come and visit her every Sunday. Mom loved the church magazines. In fact, what, last Thursday, when she was at the hospital, Bishop Norton came to see us. And mom was telling him about an article that she had just read in a church magazine and that he should go read it. <laughs> Mom's always been there for us. Like family says, growing up, we had four of us a year apart. I don't know how mom and dad did it, but they were always there. We always said that we grew up with our parents because since they were so young when they had us, we all kind of all grew up together. But we were always raised with love. And we always knew that we were loved. We didn't have a lot of money growing up. But we didn't go without anything. Moms, remember mom sewing, my sisters and I, prom dresses so that we could go to the proms because we couldn't afford to buy them. So mom would buy them, We'd sew them up. In fact, my daughter was saying the other day that she got a picture of a, of a Easter dress that mom had sewed for her. Mom worked jobs that she could here and there to help support the family along with dad. One of the jobs that she held was that down at the old rock church down here that used to be a fabric manor. They sold fabric there. And our kids went to elementary school right there across the street. Remember my kids going over there. Remember Cordell and Steffi, that always, Emily, that always go over to Fabric Manor to go see grandma when they had a chance. They loved having grandma close by. 
Our kids grew up helping grandma and grandpa in the Christmas trees. They sold Christmas trees for years and years. And so our kids grew up, a lot of the grandkids grew up helping sell Christmas trees. Our parents taught us by example, how to work hard and how to play hard and how to love. Mom always liked to look nice. She always had to have her hair combed and have nice clothes on. She didn't, wouldn't go anywhere. She didn't look nice. She would always say, her best saying was, you can't do anything until you get up and shower and get your hair combed and then you can do things. Even if you're sick, you're not gonna feel better if you don't get up and shower and get dressed. So we did. That was mommy's mom's motto. Few funny things about grandma. Before my dad passed away, several years before, mom was getting her, doing her hair in the morning, getting her ready. And for some reason, she thought the hairspray was on the front room or on the kitchen counter. And so she went and got the hairspray. Sprayed her hair with red paint. <laughs> Dad worked really hard to get that paint out of her hair. But I'm surprised she had any left. <laughs> we didn't, like you said, we, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't go on many vacations. But the one vacation that we remember, Doug and I was talking about it yesterday, as we went to Wyoming to see my Aunt Margaret family was living in Wyoming, mom's sister. So we was heading out there and we stopped, I don't know, some little town along the way and put up a tent to sleep in that night. And during the middle of the night, it was a small town and so the, the volunteer fire alarm went off. And so it sounded like it was right outside the tent. And so it all scared all of us kids together to death and as well as mom. She stayed in the tent while dad went to figure out what was going on with us. So mom was always there with us to take care of us. We were blessed to be able to go on two cruises with our parents. One time we went to um, a Caribbean cruise. And we had, you know, Kay and Marv and Dean and Linda and Gary and I, I think Richard and Sharon were there. We went on one of this Caribbean cruise and we went on to a private island and, and uh, we were all kind of out doing our thing and mom and dad was sitting on the beach watching the waves and just watching people and got back and mom had a drink and she says, this is the best pina colada I've ever had. I says, mom, did you forget to tell Bridget? <laughs> I think it's the only drink of alcohol she ever had in her life. <laughs> She was quite distraught. <laughs> yeah, we had fun times. Another time we went to Hawaii. It was on uh, Kauai, island of Kauai. And uh, we got there and we, we went to Walmart and bought some chairs and set them up on the beach for mom and, and dad to sit in. And, and some of the other family members went for a hike up the hill. Gary and I stayed with mom and dad. Well, dad needed to go up the bathroom. So I walked up with dad to the bathroom. Dad and Gary stayed with mom. Well, in the meantime, a big wave came in. I mean, we were like 75 feet off the ocean. A big wave came in and it knocked mom right off her chair. And everything, you know, that was there went floating by, you know, knocked them all and so, Gary jumps up and he sees the Diet Coke go by and mom go back and what am I going to save? <laughs> he saved mom. So <laughs> she always says that, mom, that Gary saved her from tsunami. The tsunami didn't kill her because Gary saved her. <laughs> so we're thankful that Gary saved her. <laughs> but she's, she, she loved to have fun. And she loved it. We, we enjoyed being with her all the time. So, like we said, since dad passed away, we've been able to spend a lot of time with her. 
Uh, my husband, Gary, been able to serve uh, her and working in her yard, getting her sprinklers going every year and getting them put away. And whenever anything was going on, she'd call Gary. Dory's husband, Robbie, was her, her uh, lawnmower. Every week, he was over there taking care of her lawn. He made sure that she had a beautiful yawn, lawn all the time. So we were blessed to be able there to be there and serve her. Like Doug said, we were able to be with her every day. When Linda or I or when Kay came down, she would go or Dory on Saturdays because she didn't work. But other than that, we were there every day going to lunch and shopping. Linda and I, we go, we don't know how to shop without mom by our side. Because that's what we always did. Mom loved to go shopping. Can't tell you how many clothes we had to throw up, give the DI because it had tags on because they're still new. But she loved to buy it. So that's okay. She loved to look nice. It was mom's decision to go to Terrace Grove. And we're thankful that she she did the last few months of her life. It was a good place for her, and I don't know what it would have done if she had been home this last week. We're blessed that she was there. They had, she had good people to take care of her. We know that mom doesn't hurt anymore. She, she'd been hurting her back, her legs been hurting for a long time. We know she's not hurting anymore. I'm thankful that she could be with my dad. They can celebrate together. Thankful for my family, for all, my, all my children, my grandchildren, and the support that they've always given to me and to their grandma. They all love their grandma. I'm thankful for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the blessing it is in my life and the knowledge that we have. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Like Richard said, some of us are public speakers and some of us aren't. But anyway, um, on mom's 80th birthday, um, the sisters put together a book for her with tributes from all of the kids and the grandkids and some of the great grandkids. And uh, I wrote a tribute to her then. I thought it was kind of appropriate to uh, tell you today what I wrote. And so I was talking to her. So this is, I'm talking to mom here. Where do I start in telling you how much I love you and what a large part of my life you are? You have always, always been there for me. We don't always realize how lucky we are to have our family when we are young. But as I grow older, I know that my family is my whole life. Nothing else really matters, does it? Physical possessions are just things but our family and memories are the only things we have that will be with us now and through the eternities. All my early childhood memories include you, of course. I remember you sewing alike dresses for us when we were little, and we were so proud, us three girls, to dress in those alike dresses. I remember how upset you were with me the time that I decided to go meet Linda at school, and I missed her. And I waned and waned and waned on the corner for her to come, but she didn't come. And finally, you came and found me waiting on the corner for her. I'm not sure long, how long I've been missing, but I do remember the spanking I got. I guess I scared you to death. It took me becoming a mother myself before I really figured out why you were so mad at me. We always had jobs to do, and you were always teaching us by working alongside of us. I remember doing dishes, making beds, Saturday cleaning, and lots of helping you cook, then being assigned to cook dinner myself as I got a little older. 
That was my favorite. I think you're letting me cook so much when I was young helped to instill in me the love of cooking. I still have today. It is one of my biggest pleasures to cook dinner for my family. Thanks for teaching me that skill. I also remember the bean picking. You took us to pick beans instead of sending us. As I grow older, I realized what a difference that made for you to take us and work alongside of us instead of just sending us. I also remember all the fruit and vegetables we bottled. I used to think that we worked so hard. It took growing up a little bit to realize how much harder you worked than us. I know our, fam I know our early life wasn't all work. We did lots of fun things too. I remember the fun trips we took, you being scared that night the sirens went off, like Nadine always already said. I also remember another trip to Yellowstone and how the, the car broke down and you were so scared about that, but you trooped us around after, I think, for three days while they fixed the car. Some of my favorite trips were when you took us school shopping every year. You helped us stretch our money and then we would come home and have our fashion shows. That was lots of fun. You always made Christmas a big event at our house. You made sure we had a good Christmas. Even though we didn't have a lot of money, we always had a good Christmas. Santa Claus always came and you made sure that we believed. We can't talk about Christmas without talking about Christmas trees. What a big job for you, but you were right out there working and putting in those long cold hours. I have to share some funny things too about how about the times that you told us that if we didn't behave, you would pick one of us up and swing us around until we knocked all the rest of us down. <laughs> and then there were the times when we were fighting and driving you crazy and you would make us stand there and sing Love at Home. And we usually all ended up laughing, so I guess it worked. After we were married, you didn't give up on mothering us. I remember I drive from Providence to Montpelier when I was in labor with Michelle. I was way too dumb to be scared, but you were scared enough for both of us. You didn't want to deliver that baby in the car. Then after Wayne was born and I got phlebitis so bad, you came to Bear Lake, gathered the kids and me up and took us home so you could take care of us. I'll always remember when I was in the hospital after my cancer surgeries. You never left my side. I know you were worried about me and I was worried about you sitting there with no sleep. Thank you for helping me through that hard time. Your unconditional support and love have made a huge difference in making me fight through the cancer. We've had a lot of good times too. The fishing trips in the old camper, Thanksgiving dinners, all our annual Christmas parties, and that memorable trip to the World's Fair the year after I had cancer. Lagoon cruises, and of course, just sitting on a deck and playing card games at the lake house. We had lots of fun times on camping trips when our kids were young. Wayne wrote about an Ibsen while the family camp out in his tribute to grandma, he wrote. Just yesterday, I was working in St. Charles Canyon. My mind replayed a memory of going on a walk with grandma, with grandma, Corey and Troy from Porcupine Campground. We walked through the campground to the west and up the road with Min to, Mon to Minnetonka Cave. Grandma was in her house coat and had curlers in her hair, but she was happy as a clam to walk in public with three wild boys. As I walked that same path today, tears filled my eyes, knowing how much she always loved me and how much she contributed to, to who I am. All of these times are part of what makes this family, thank you. Our entire life has been a life of family first, thanks to our mom. Our family has remained close, thanks to our mom. We have celebrated the good times and worried and mourned through the hard times together, thanks to our mom. You have left a legacy of love, of family, and we are proud of you and love you very much. Cheryl summed it up when she said, the Bedrills have shown me the meaning of the word family. They truly are a family of friends. 
And to think it all started with grandma and grandpa Badrero. I have this picture in my head of grandma with tears in her eyes saying, I just love my family so much. And we all heard it many times. I just love my family so much. Cheryl said, you know what? I just love my grandma Badrero. She's one of a kind. We all love mom. And I hope and pray that she will be happy. Give dad a hug for me and rest in peace. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our mother is just, as you've heard from my siblings, she was a sweetheart and she loved us all so much and she made sure everybody knew how much she loved us. I can say truly that we have been blessed beyond measure to have, to have our mom. That song that needing, the girls sing, my daughter, Lori, every time she'd visit my mom, my mom would say, Lizzie, my granddaughter is going to be singing this song at my funeral. And so one day Lori took a picture of it. So at least we knew the name of it. And then um, we could, she couldn't find it on the internet. We don't even know what it sounded like. So Monday, we went up to her house and I told Lori, we're gonna look for this hat song. We had a couple different places to look. I went to one shelf, pulled out a folder and there it was, sing at funeral. And it, 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 she wanted it sung and thank you girls for making your grandma happy. Because that's one thing she asked for. That's the only thing she asked for. Thank you for making her happy. I've been with my mom for 75 years. I love my mom. She is, she's been my best friend, my sweetheart. I, we've, she's like the girl said, everybody said she's always there for us. Anytime we needed our mom, she was there. We called our mom, she was there for us. Um, when we were little in Logan, you look back, she had these four little kids and my dad would come home every day and play with us. And now you know why. When was she going to get work done with these four little kids? Because she played with us all day. And we'd make clothes, clothes pin paper doll houses on the floor and play paper dolls. Our mom was always there playing with us and having a good time. But yet sometimes... She had to get the laundry done and the washing and the ironing and the sewing because there was no disposable diapers at that time. You know? And she washed in a ringer washer. She, mom was a hard worker. Like the girl said, when we picked beans, when we were teenagers, she would drive us in every morning, drop Richard off at a babysitter, draw, drive us in to the tabernacle. We would get on a bus, go out to Trenton and pick beans all day. She was the supervisor. She worked right there with us the whole time. Our mom was always there for us, no matter what. I'm just going to end that. Well, she's, she loved Relief Society. She loved DUP. She wanted me to be in the DUP with her. So when we cut my husband and I got home from our mission, I joined the DUP with her. So we've been in DUP together. And she loved that. Um, one thing, one, a couple, just a couple things. Um, when we moved her over to Terrace Crow, she had this chair in her bedroom. And I said, well, we don't need to take this chair, Mom. She says, yes, that's the chair I sit in to pray. And so we had to make sure we sit that chair in there. So I called it her Rami Upton because <laughs> she, she had to have that particular chair in there for her to pray on. So one time when I was a young mom and I was really tired and I was working and I mean, I was just taking care of kids and everything. And I was kind of like complaining to my mom on the phone. And she said, Linda just be grateful that you can get tired. And I've thought about that so much through the years. What a blessing it is to be able to get tired. And it took my mom to point that out to me because not everybody can get tired. I love my mom with all my heart. She's been there for me no matter what. We are blessed beyond measure to have had her for as long as we did. Very few people get to be my age and still have their mother with them and still have her vibrant like she was right up until the last day, last two days of her life. I'll never, ever, ever be able to repay my mother for the love she shared to me 
for the things she taught me. She taught us how to love. I was never able to pull off the skills of being a mother that she could. On Saturday mornings when we were young, she would go with Dora Hansi to get a Coke and they would go driving around. She would come, she would give us our chores and she would come home and she would just, oh my gosh, my girls, look at what they did for me. They just, oh, they're so wonderful. And she just praised us and praised us. So of course, next week when she left, what did we do? We worked even harder. <laughs> You know, I was never able to pull that off. I would love to have pulled that trick off, but I was never able to pull that one off. <laughs> but she got us to do an awful lot of work. She, she's a sweetheart. We love our mother. She made Christmas magical. She made holidays magical. She loved us unconditionally, and we love her. And I know that she is with my dad. She's with our son. He passed away. And she's looking down on all of us. And she'll be there to still help us. She'll give us little nudges, just like she did finding this music. She says that she'll be there for us to, to help us and to continue to love us. And the only thing I think she really wants us to do is to continue to love each other. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. I think I could sit here and listen all day long. I knew she was a spitfire, but I was even more than I even knew. She's a good lady. Thanks for your comments, your tributes. Uh, before I get to my, my remarks, I just want to announce the pallbearers and the casket escorts. These are all grandchildren with one that's a church grandson. Wayne Beck. Troy James, Cordell Ballard, Ty Parker, Stacy Nettles, Amanda Nettles, Rachel Nettles, Kimberly Coons, and the casket escorts will be Michelle Kofid, Lori James Young, Randy Dunn, Carrie Hemmert, Julie James, Tessa Thornley, Andrea Beck, Tammy Campbell, Tanisha Bailey, Amy Lynn Bishop, Stephanie Warchow, Kelly Bedrero, Tracy Miller, Emily Ballard, and Troy Bedrero. After my remarks, we'll sing uh, hymn number 152, God Be With You, so we read again, followed by a closing prayer by Tracy Miller. We will then go to the Providence City Cemetery, and we'll have the dedication of the grave, which will be given by a grandson, Wayne Beck. As part of my remarks, I have felt impressed since Sunday to have my counselor, Brother Parker, say a few words. Brother Parker has taken Theon into his family's life. 
as his own. He has treated her like a mother. And it has weighed on me since Sunday. So I would like to turn a little a few minutes over to him to share some thoughts that he's had the last couple of days. Thank you, Bishop. It's uh, it's a privilege to be able to speak to you today at, at Theon's funeral. I've known uh, Daryl Theon my, most of my life. We moved to Providence when I was about 10 years old, and I, I just knew who they were. And, uh, and I, I moved away when I grew up, and and uh, back in 2008, why uh, my family and I moved back into the ward, and we came to uh, to church here in this very building, and and by golly, there was the there was the Pedreros. I, I knew those people from from way back when, when I was a little kid. And uh, um, as we've as we've been back here in, in the area, why we've we've got to got reacquainted with with the Pedreros. And my oldest son Ty was, uh, uh, I think it was Bishop Swink that started the tradition in our ward of, of assigning each of the young men a ward grandma to take care of, and. Uh, Theon was was Ty's ward grandma, and so we got to shovel the snow and rake her leaves and, and look after her. And we've gotten to be really close with with Theon, and uh, uh, I wanted to share just a, a couple of, of experiences that that, that we had the, uh, with her um, during uh, during COVID. Me and my boys were were able to come and, and bring the sacrament to her each week, and and as we did that, we would, it would take a long time because we'd sit and talk after. And uh, sometimes when I, when I wasn't able to come, I'd just send the boys and they'd say, it sure goes faster when you're not there, dad. <laughs> and, and when we would, we would sit here and we, we, we would talk about family and we'd talk about uh, the gospel. We'd talk about what, she, what she'd been reading in the Book of Mormon in, in the past week or so. And, and it was always, always a good time. One of the one of the choices experience I had with Theon was that uh, shortly after I was called to this position, the bishopric, I I had I'd only I'd only been able I had the opportunity to give maybe one or two temple recommend interviews, and uh, Theon was laid up at home. She had a back or a leg or a hip problem. I forget what it was, but this uh, she she wasn't able to come to church for a while, and uh, she had asked that somebody would come and and uh, and give her a temple recommended review because her, her recommend was about to expire. And Bishop says, uh, Brother Parker, why don't you go down there? And I says, you sure? I'm pretty green at this. I don't know what I'm doing. He says, oh, it'll, be, it'll be good. Don't you worry. And so I, I came and it was on a Sunday, uh, Sunday, Sunday afternoon. And, and I, I come and uh, we sat in the front room and, and, and I, I asked, uh, I asked the owner the, the temple questions. And, when she gave her answers, she, she looked me right in the eye and she'd nod her head and she'd say, yes, sir. And what I got from her was the depth of her testimony, the Theon knows well today she knows then she knew what was going to be coming and uh it was it was a sweet experience to be there for for that recommended interview and afterward we were talking and uh one of the questions that she often asked me when we would be visiting is she'd say why am i still here i've been here a long time and uh and I says, I says, the only, I says, I think that one of the reasons, or I says, some, the reasons I think that you're still here is because if you're much love, you're much wisdom that you have to share with all of us and you're a good example. And, and I, I, I look over the room here and, and it's, it's full of, of the Bedrero posterity and there's a lot of you. <laughs> and I think that, that the own is up there right now. And she's smiling that you're all here today. But one of the things that she said that day that, that reminds me of this is that she said, she says, I need to be ready because at some point when my work here is done, I'm going to cross through that veil. 
Uh, I need to be worthy. Because Daryl's waiting there for me. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that Mother Theon had an unshakable testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And part of her legacy is that each one of us can strive to live up to her example. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Jared. <laughs> On behalf of the province third ward, I would like to offer my condolences to your family. We will miss her. She was a rock star in our ward. Thanks for insisting on bringing it to this building. I walked in here last night and uh, I was by myself at a moment and Theon and Daryl's hands built this place. It was very fitting. I appreciate it. I've asked President Swink to the lobby to have this building back. Over the last five days, seven days, I've had quite an experience with Theon, and I'd like to share just a few pieces of it, maybe in reverse order. The last couple of days, I've talked to each of the released society that are still living. I first talked to Vivian Majin, and then I talked to Marilyn Bell, and then I met Madeline Barlow for the very first time. Marilyn Bell pointed something out to me that I'd never thought of about your grandma and your mom, her name, Theon. If you're to break it into two, it means the one. Your grandma loved to be the one. <laughs> That's what I've learned a lot about the last couple of days is she loved to be the one. Vivian Majin made her feel like the one a lot, her and her husband, Bill and Vivian. They brought her to church for the very last time. It had been months since she had been there, and she was able to come to our Christmas program two weeks ago, which was the final time that she attended church. Her daughters had all mentioned that she loved to be the star and that Daryl spoiled her. I didn't know Daryl, but he must have been one heck of a guy. And by the way, we call Bishop Swink President Bishop now, just so you know, Doug. I'd like to just talk about the one. Madeline pointed out to me that every time she would talk about her kids, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, her great, great ones, it always started this way. My Linda, my Nadine, my Kay, my Doug, my Richard, and my Dory or my grandson, whose name would follow, my granddaughter, whose name would follow, and so forth. She had a gift to make you feel like you were the one. It applied to all of us, and she loved you. She would talk about you every time I visited her, every time. I have an assignment for you. For each of you grandchildren, I have watched over the last two days as each of you have approached her casket, and I've seen many of you melt, and your heart hurts. You will miss her. I want you to take the one, the one thing that you learned from her, and put it in your phone or put it somewhere where you can see it. And you take that one thing and you give it forward. You give it to those that need it. She was so talented at that. In closing, last Thursday, I woke up in the morning. I'd been out of town for a couple of days. Well, my wife, I said, I need to go see Theon Bedrero this morning. Didn't think much of it. Just thought I would go make another visit. 
went to work for an hour and I waited till nine o'clock to give her some time to sleep in. But I didn't find her there. I went there about 9.30. So I called Linda and uh, I said, sorry. Where's your mom? I can't find her. I need to see her today. And she said to me, she's in the emergency room. She fell. So I went to the hospital. So the lady out front, I needed to see Theon Bedrow. I was her bishop and like to see her. And I walked in there and you know how Theon was. He sat by her side and the first thing she would do is grab your hand and make you feel like you were the one. And she told me all the great things that had happened for the last seven days of her life, even though she was in so much pain. She could hardly stand it. We gave her a blessing, and we the last thing she said to me was, I love you, and I love my family so much. I didn't know what happened, what would happen in the coming days. But I knew that she would be at peace with whatever it was. I will miss her. We will all miss her. And I testify to you that there will be a day you will see her again in a perfect form. And she will embrace you again. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our dear Father in heaven, we are grateful that we could gather to celebrate Grandma's life. We're grateful for her and her love and her example. We're grateful for all of those who participated today on the program and those who are here and watching for all those lives who have touched Grandma's. We pray that we can remember this celebration, that we can remember the good memories that we have, and that we can all emulate her example of love as we serve and love those around us. Please bless us now as we travel to the cemetery and to our homes that we will be safe on these snowy roads. Please bless us with comfort and peace and assurance that families are forever. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.